Just some of the kids received the Holy Ghost while we were down there, and there were reports of healings that had taken place and people being delivered and set free. And so we're thanking God for all of that. I encourage you next year, we want as many people as can go. We've got stuff for the children where we're doing camp. We're going to have more things for children during the days and at night. So it's a great time for the family to come together and you can worship. There'll be a couple services. Parents can be by themselves while the children are getting ministered to by our children's evangelists. And uh, it really is just a great time, and so we encourage everybody to go down there for that. Matthew chapter number 28, before I get started, just announce this. Don't forget, in a couple of weeks, on August the 9th, is our uh, block party here at the church. We'd love to have you here from 4 to 7 o'clock. We need people to help set up and tear down and volunteer to run uh, bounce houses and food and registration tables and all of that stuff. And if you can help in any way, uh, both with your time and monetarily, Please see Brother and Sister Hoffman. Brother Hoffman's up there running the multimedia in the South. Please let them know if you want to give financially, if you're going to pay with a check, just make it up to FAC in the memo box, put block party. So we know the money is going towards the block party. And I want to tell the church this. I was uh, I walked into church Friday night. I was never seeing the service, but I walked into church Friday night. You're going to have to grip with my throat. You know, church can't be just shouting and all that stuff. So my, my throat is kind of uh, messed up. But... I walked into church and the Lord spoke to me and just said, give $5,000. I said, okay. I don't know what we're giving to you. We're going to give $5,000. And uh, they took up an offering for uh, missions. And, uh, and they wanted to raise $20,000. And I said, okay, God, I know where the $5,000 is going to. And if you know anything about where we are as a church financially, we really don't have $5,000 to give it. But the Lord spoke to me and said, we're going to give $5,000. And it's, we have to give it in the next three months. So I just want you to put that in the back of your mind if you feel God moving upon you uh, to give to missions. We're going to take up our quarterly missions offering uh, next month. But uh, if you want to give any time to missions on the tie that below, there's a box that says missions. But we're going to give $5,000 as a church. I don't know how, where it's going to come from, how we're going to get it. But we're going to get it. We're going to do it in Jesus' name because God is going to provide. That's one thing about God. When God tells you to do something, you just do it. You don't have to worry about how it's going to happen or how we're going to get it. It's just going to happen. And Jesus says, get out the boat, you just get out the boat. You know, you can't walk on water, but if he says, get out the boat, you just go ahead and do it. And you know that you're going to walk on water. So we're going to give $5,000 to missions within the next three months. So if you want to help out with that in any way, uh, if you want to give it in a tight envelope and check the missions box and how much and all that stuff, amen, God will bless you for it. I know it. Matthew 28, beginning at verse number 18. You know, when Brother Matt Purdue was talking about the offering, he said, give a number that your church secretary would have a heart attack about. And uh, I walked up and told her, I said, we're going to get $5,000 for the first time to the church. And uh, after church, my sister, Amy, who is the secretary, Sister West, she said, you know what? I knew you were going to get $5,000 because the Lord spoke to her that you were going to get $5,000. So it's confirmation. That means God is going to do it. And God wants to use you. And God wants to use me to do it. Amen. Matthew 28, verse number 18. The Bible says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. I want to teach or talk this morning, I just want to minister this morning on this title, For the Love of Souls. For the Love of Souls. One of the biggest, I think, underrated ministries that there are in the church. Everybody wants to be a pastor. Everybody wants to be a preacher. Everybody wants to get behind a pulpit or get a microphone in their hand to sing. But I'll tell you, one of the biggest underrated ministries there are is just being a soul winner. Just being somebody that loves souls. And when you begin to talk about soul winning, I, I immediately go back to Jesus Christ. What the best example of soul winning there could be. If you look at his life and his ministry, the Bible says, you know, he grows up, he finds himself at a young age in the temple, he's teaching and expounding upon the book of Isaiah, and he's blowing the, the priests and the prophets' minds of, of what he is talking about. There's a lot of things that are going on, but if you look at his life, we do and we know because we know the Bible, we read the Bible, that he is God manifested in the flesh. That he comes down and he robes himself in flesh. That he leaves the throne of heaven. He comes down to dwell among us. Wraps himself in this so-called flesh. Leaves paradise. Leaves perfection. To come down and be with us. The first thing he does in his ministry. 
is he goes and he is tempted in the wilderness. He's led away, he's fasted in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, and is tempted of the devil in the wilderness. And then he overcomes the temptation and he goes in. The first thing that he does is he doesn't go off and do a bunch of miracles. The first thing that he does is he doesn't go into the temple where they're trying to demand a microphone and say, I just got done fasting 40 days and 40 nights. I've got a word from God. That's not what he did. He didn't go and go to the marketplace and build himself a, a pulpit and say, everybody come here and listen to what I have to say. He didn't do any of that. But the first thing that he did, and you can find it in Matthew chapter number 4, beginning at verse number 18. And Jesus, the Bible says, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their ship and their father and followed him. The very first thing that Jesus did when he was done fasting and praying, when he was done overcoming the devil, was not to go find a pulpit to preach and a microphone to sing at because he had that gift. We all know that he had the gift of, of he could preach. We all know that he could teach. But he didn't go seeking for that first. The very first thing that he did was he went and found some souls to save. He went fishing for some men. He went just walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw just Peter and James and all of them just sitting out there. And Peter and Andrew minding their nets. And then James and John, they're minding their nets. And he said, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. The very first thing that he did was not to give glory to himself, but it was to impart into other people. It was to go out and to make disciples. Ultimately, what Jesus then had was just a love of souls. He realized that's why he came here. When I think about souls, he goes through all of this. 40 days, 40 nights. He's tempted of the devil, the weakest point of his fasting. He only really, look at the life of Jesus. He only had really 12 close friends. And if you want to be particular, probably 15. He's got his 12 disciples, and then we all know how much he loved Lazarus. So you got to count Lazarus in there as one of his friends. That's 13, and he lived with Mary and Martha, his sister. So they were very close with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So if you want to be technical, of all the people that were alive back then, he had maybe 15 close friends. People wanted to see him for what he could do, but not for who he was. People pressed to see him. They weren't just excited to see Jesus. They wanted to see what could he do for me. What kind of miracles could he perform today? What, what can you do for me? They didn't care about who he was. They wanted to know, what can you do for me? I'm talking about love of souls this morning. The whole time he was around, he was reaching for souls. He had the Sadducees and the Pharisees trying to kill him and trying to trick him. Jesus went out of his way to reach people. You can look at the story of Zacchaeus that he stayed along the way. He would go certain places because he knew there were people that he needed to touch. He loved people even though he knew they didn't really love him. But just what he could do for them. He realized to a lot of people he was just a toy. To a lot of people they didn't really care about him. They just wanted something from him. He realized, even though he was abused, even though he felt neglected, even though he knew that they didn't want him for who he was, he still loved them. He gave of himself everywhere that he went. This man named Jesus fed 5,000 people at one time. Men, not counting women and children. At another occasion, fed 4,000 men, not counting women and children. With just a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. I'm talking about the love of souls here this morning. He healed the lame. He healed the blind. He healed the halt. He healed the maimed. He raised the dead. The limbs were restored in people. And the list can go on and on and on. I'm talking about for the love of souls this morning. All that he did was for the love of souls. He allowed himself. I want 
want you to listen to this. He allowed himself to go through the garden of Gethsemane to be betrayed. He allowed himself to go through the torture of being betrayed. The torture of being denied. The torture of being whipped, abused, cussed at, smacked, buffeted, came, shoved, spit on. He was slapped. He was belittled. He was mocked. He had thorns shoved into his skull and his cranium. He had his back ripped apart by the cat of nine tails. He carried a cross all the way to a hill called Mount Calvary. He allowed huge nails, railroad ties. If you look at what they found, railroad ties were basically the same thing, those big, long, thick nails. He allowed himself to lay on wooden cross that he carried and allowed them to take those big huge hunk of nails and driven through his hands and through his feet. He allowed himself to suffer through the suffocation of being on the cross. He allowed himself to suffer through the loneliness feeling of being abandoned. That's why he told God, he said, why have you forsaken me? He said, I, I, I know what it's like to be abandoned. He suffered through feeling his blood flow and feeling the blood run down his cheeks from his face, feeling the blood run and drip down his arms from his nail-pierced hands, feeling the blood run down the back as the flesh was ripped apart and looks like hamburger meat. He could feel the, 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 the splinters of the wood that would come and pierce his back as he was moving up and down the cross. I am talking about a love of souls here this morning. He felt the blood flow down his cheeks, running down his arms. He felt the blood run down his legs, all the way down to his toes. When he would look down, he could see his blood dripping from his toes and see a pool of blood that was piling up at the foot of the cross. Why would anybody go through all of that? Why would anybody allow themselves to be betrayed and denied whipped and abused and cussed at and smacked and buffeted and came and shoved and spit on? Why would they allow themselves to be slapped and belittled and mocked, have cords come through their head? Why would they allow themselves to have their back ripped apart by a whip for 39 or 40 times? Why would they allow themselves those nails to go through their hands and their feet? Why would they allow a crown of thorns to be shoved through his head? Why would he allow to hang there when at any moment, Brother Klein, he could have called a multitude of angels that could have come down and got him off that cross. Why did he stay there? Why did he allow every bit of blood flow from his body? Why did he allow himself to go through the suffocation of the cross and his lungs being ripped apart? Why did he go through the agony of the cross, Brother Titus? I want you to know the reason why he did that is because of he said, I love you so much, and I care about you so much, that I am willing to go through all that I am about to go through, because I love you, and because I love souls. It's all about for the love of souls. Jesus wasn't about accolades. He wasn't about trying to draw a big following for himself, but rather you find in his ministry that he would spend most of his time trying to get in isolation, trying to get away from the crowd. But the reason why he stayed where the crowds were is because he had a love for souls. He did things that in his natural body he didn't want to do. He didn't like going through multitudes of people and people shoving him, trying to touch him, and having to get like the FBI around him so he could get from one place to another. And he didn't like all the attention that he was getting, but he said, the reason why I'm going to hang out here and the reason why I'm going to allow myself to do this is because I love you enough that I'm going to get out of my own comfort zone and I am going to go to where you are because I know that you have a need. He knew that people were late that couldn't get to him. He said, I'm going to walk down this pathway so I can find that
of souls. Everything he did was for the love of souls. We talk about souls. How much we need to win the lost. And how much we really love God. In John chapter number 21, beginning at verse number 15. The Bible says that this is after Jesus is crucified. He had risen from the dead. And he was uh, going out there. We have a dinner. He went to the seashore. Saw the disciples fishing again. He went right back to where he did before his fishing. Jesus said, go walk down the other side. Caught some fish. They brought it to the shore. And Jesus began to make them some fish. In John 21, 15. The Bible says, so when they had died, and Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon the son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He said unto them, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said it the second time, Simon, the son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, the son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now we know in the life of Peter, the reason probably why Jesus asked him three times was because Peter denied him three times when he was about to be crucified, when he was in the courts and saw Jesus being drugged into Pilate or Caiaphas. It was Caiaphas at that time. Or maybe it was Herod, one of them. And he goes in there and people said, you're one of them. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never known the man. They said, well, I know you because your speech betrayed to you. Your speech says you're doing Jesus. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. He denies him three times. And so Jesus now is giving him another chance. And he's restoring what had been broken. He's restoring what had been denied when he had denied him. And he says, lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? And he said, you know that I love you. Yes, I love you. He said, feed my thanks. I want to just break off from the fact that he was maybe restoring Peter. To the fact that he said, if you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. And you're going to feed my lambs. In other words, if we love Jesus, it is not just about us. If we love Jesus, he said, go find some lambs. And go find some sheep. And go feed them. He said, if you truly love me, don't look for a pulpit to preach at. Don't, don't look for a microphone that you can sing behind. Don't look for all of that stuff. But he said, if you truly love me, if you really want to be my disciple, if you really want to be my apostle, if you really want to be and fulfill that, that role of being my right-hand man, he said, I need you to go and feed some lambs, and I need you to go and feed some sheep. In other words, what Jesus might be asking us here today is, do you love me? And do you love souls? Because if you do love me, and if you do love souls, he says, go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. If you love me, you're going to get outside of the four walls of the church because he said, hey, I went through strategic ways. I didn't go down the normal route sometimes just so I could touch a soul because I love them. He said, I'm going to lead you some places that might be inconvenient. I'm going to lead you some places that you might never have been down before. You might take a different way to work in the morning just so you can minister to somebody. You might go to a different store than you normally go to just because there's somebody you're buying groceries next to that might need a word from the Lord that God wants you to give to them. Are you willing to be inconvenienced to for a soul? Are you willing to I'm coming to you. 
It's a man that can take you from the gutter and 
He said, I'm going to set you forth. He says, go out in the parable of the supper. He says, go out and compel them to come and let my house may be full. I imagine that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be a big equity hall. In my mind. You think about weddings, you think about banquet halls and stuff. In my mind, heaven is a big old banquet hall. And he's ready, ready to have a party. He's ready to celebrate the end of the marriage supper of the Lamb. He says, just keep going out and reaching. Keep going out and inviting. He said, well, I've been told no so many times. Who cares? How many times was Jesus told no? I don't know. I don't know how many times he was. I'm sure that he was told no. The rich young ruler walked away from him and said, forget this job. I'd rather have my earthly possessions than anything else. He was neglected. He was turned down. He was told no. He was betrayed. People might leave you. All he said to do was keep inviting. Keep compelling them to come in. Keep ministering to them no matter where they are. No matter what lifestyle they have. No matter if they're big or small. No matter the color of their skin. All he sees is a soul. And God wants us to be the church in our area. That just has nothing more than a love for souls. Why are we faithful in the house of God? It's more than because we love God. Because at any given Sunday, at any given Tuesday, any given Thursday, or any time that we decide to have church, there are kids that are here that may have never tasted of the goodness of God. And we need to have an atmosphere and we need to have an environment where they can come in and feel the presence of God and we can minister to them and pray with them that they might be healed. Because the effectual perfect prayer of a righteous man availeth us. Why are we faithful? Why are we faithful in giving? It's more than just God commands it. Because we love God, number one, and to the dollars that we bring into the house of God, it does more than pay the pastor and pay the heat bill and all that stuff. But we're investing it back into the kingdom of God. We are doing things for the love of soul. Why do we sing? Why do we worship? Why do we dress this way? Why are we different? Because we love soul. We want them to see a difference in us. Why are we going to reach out to those that nobody else wants to reach out to? Because we love soul. Why are we going to do we go the extra mile? Why are we going to do things that might be a little unconventional to some people? The reason is because we love souls. Everything we do should be about souls. When we're out at the mall, it's more than just a shopping trip. When we're out at Kroger or Martins, it's more than just a shopping trip. There's a soul there that might be held. There's a soul there that you might be able to invest in. There is a soul there. Not saying you have to buy everybody's groceries or, or pay the drive through the person behind you when you're going through McDonald's and all that stuff. Yeah, every once in a while, that's nice. I've done that a few times myself. And if you have church cards, give the church card and say, just tell them Jesus loves you. Or do something nice for them. But sometimes it's positioning ourselves and allowing God to use us just to speak a word to somebody. Maybe you're out somewhere, you're not normally there, and you'll see something that happened in the church in a few weeks or a few months, maybe a few years, that you can minister to them. Let everything we do be centered around souls. Why do we have a children's evangelistic service once a quarter? Because we are investing in our children, because we want to see them saved. And every time we've done this, at least one has been baptized and one has received the Holy Ghost. That is why we do it, for the love of souls. Why are we having a block party? couple of weeks. Oh, we're not going to have a church service. We may not sing. We may not preach. And that's all well. Why are we giving out 150 free backpacks? Why are we giving out free food? Why are we doing that? It's more than just promoting the church, but we're promoting Him. We're promoting Jesus Christ. And we're doing it because we love souls. Let everything we do be about the love of souls. Would you stand with me? If Jesus Christ Himself God manifested in the flesh, and his whole existence and whole life was centered around souls. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, I'm going to show you what you must do. I taught a lesson a few uh, months ago about follow who will lead them. That same principle applies. When he said, follow me, he said, I want you to watch me. Watch what I do, because when I lead you, he said, I've given you an example. He said, so when I lead you, you're going to know what to do. You're going to know how to do it. When Jesus went through, he said, I prayed for the sick. They were healed. I prayed for those that were demonically possessed and they were delivered. I fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. I did all of these things. More importantly, he gave of himself. 
the greatest gift that he could give was himself. He gave of his time, he gave of his energy, he sacrificed relationships just so he could win souls. He never married. I wouldn't know we ever had a girlfriend. Some of us were so consumed about boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, I gotta get married, blah, blah, blah. Jesus forsook those things just so he could reach self. Now I say this to a man you like to know, I stand that line. Life is very important, your family is very important. We gotta see our families today. But for those of us that aren't married, are you not married, not with somebody, take the time that you have invested in the kingdom of God. And God will send you the one that you need. While you're ministering, while you're being used in ministry, God will send the person that's going to aid you along and help you along. We're so worried about all this stuff being like and who can have the most friends. Jesus had no more than probably 15 close friends. Probably had a lot of acquaintances and he would go through the cities. Oh, there's Jesus. Hey, dude, what's up? Hey, Thomas. Hey, hey, whatever your name is. Hey, good to see you. You know, he probably had some acquaintances here or there. He didn't have a whole lot of close friends. He lived in isolation. He lived alone. Are you willing to give up your life for a soul? Are you willing to lay your life down for a soul? Are you willing to pray when you don't feel like praying for a soul? Are you willing to worship? Are you willing to give? Are you willing to go to a new place? Are you willing to take a different route? Are you willing to spend financially for somebody? Are you willing to go the extra mile for a soul? Because Jesus shed his blood for you. He shed his blood for me. Would you lift your hands in this place? God, I pray that there would be God a baptism today. Not in water. Yes, we do want a baptism in water today. God, people repenting and being baptized with the Holy Ghost. But God, I want a baptism, a revival of our witness, a revival of a love of souls, a restoration of a love of souls to come into each and every heart and mind and spirit this morning. I pray, God, that we would capture your very essence in our lives, that we would capture your very purpose in our lives, that, God, that you would call us to be saints. You gave us power to be a witness. You gave us power to go to the highways and the byways and compel people to come in. You gave us power. You want us to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and visit the fatherless and, and visit those that are in prison and that are in the hospital. You called us to be more than just be a church that meets three times a week on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. But God, you want us to take the church to the city. Help us, God, have a love for souls that will turn off the TV to invest in souls, that will turn off the internet to invest in souls, that will neglect some of our own time just so we can invest in souls. God, I want to win a soul. I want to bring a soul out of a horrible pit. I want to pull somebody out of the pits of hell, like the prophet said in the book of Jude. I want to have compassion and pull them out of the fire. I want to have the compassion enough that I can see and hear the souls that are screaming in the pits of hell, wanting Jesus. Come on, do you want to be a soul winner? Ask God, burn that 
Thank you. 